Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inside Investing, the show that helps you level up your financial knowledge and sharpen your investing skills. I'm your host, Caitlin Cormier. Can you imagine retiring in the prime of your life? Think about all the time you'd have to pursue your passions without the stress that can come from the nine to five grind. It's a dream for many Canadians and one that Derek Foster managed to achieve. He was able to retire at the ripe old age of just 34 years old, all while raising a family of eight children. Now, he's the six-time best-selling author who shares his incredible story and the keys to his success. So let's hear all about it and how he retired so early. Derek, welcome to the show and thanks for being here with us. Thanks for inviting me. Your journey to early retirement is truly inspiring. What gave you the drive to pursue such an ambitious goal? Yeah, that that really wasn't my goal to begin with. Um, I was kind of a weird kid. I don't know, when I was like seven years old or something, I don't know, my uncle and aunt and my mom, we brought out the game Monopoly and I was just instantly hooked. You know, um, I wanted to play it every day, whatnot. A lot of people remember, you know, Monopoly, you know, red hotels, greenhouses, that kind of thing. But what struck me is the winner of the game was not the person that passed go the most. The winner of the game is the one that had the most investments and managed to, you know, get the most money, you know, through those means. And that sort of sent a little light bulb in my head going off and say, oh, this makes sense. You know, people who focus on passing go, who focus on their careers. Yeah, you can do okay. But perhaps having some investments, you know, you'll you'll finish further ahead. So I so I started doing that. And as I was a bit of a nerdy teenager. So I think when I was about 13 or something, I, I asked my mom, like for Christmas, I wanted a book about the stock market. So she gave me some book about the stock market. I don't remember what it was called, but I read it. It was, you know, kind of interesting to me. And so when I turned 18, I was legally allowed and I started buying stocks. And I mean, at the beginning, it turned terribly, but over time, it did reasonably well. And it wasn't until I was almost 30 that I realized, hey, I'm getting all this passive dividend income. Um, maybe I can retire early. So it wasn't a plan from the beginning, you know, but I, as the journey progressed, I sort of realized, hey, yeah, maybe I can stop working. So, you know, because work is a four letter word, by the way, right? <laughs> that's so surprising because I feel like so many people are constantly, that's like their, their the golden egg at the end of the road sort of thing. So that's pretty amazing that, uh, that just kind of doing what you wanted to do and doing something you were interested in actually got you to that uh, realization, which is that's, that's amazing. You've been retired now for nearly 20 years. So what does retired life actually look like for you? Well, um, I mean, once you retire, you have different choices that you want to make. So we, we chose to have kids. We have eight of them. So that keeps us pretty busy. Uh, what does life look like? Fairly chaotic and whatnot. Um, I don't think we could do it if we worked a conventional job. Uh, my wife was home. I was home for many, many years. I guess two years ago or so, my kids go to a, not a posh school, but a, a, a private school. It's very cheap though. Um, so, so they go there. So my wife started working there maybe two, three years ago. I don't remember exactly. Just because she was tired of being at home, wanted to get out of the house and socialize and whatnot. Um, yeah, our day looks pretty normal. You know, one pant leg after the other and all that kind of thing. The only difference is it doesn't generally start with a beeping alarm clock. So that, that's about it. <laughs> okay, so let's get into our uh, conversation and hear kind of all about how you actually reached your early retirement. Uh, so let's start at the very beginning. How did you first start investing and get an early jump on building your nest egg? You kind of mentioned the passion building through Monopoly, which I love because that completely makes sense. Um, but yeah, how did you kind of get started? Yeah, so when I was 18, I was legally allowed to buy stocks. So I thought I'm going to buy some stocks. And at that time, I was working at a company called Radio Shack. It's, it's now called The Source, um, but they sell electronics and whatnot. And so, so I was working there. And about a year before I was working there, the shares were trading at $60 a share and they had fallen all the way down to $24 a share. So I didn't know anything. I was 18 years old, but I had my life savings at about $5,000, give or take. So I said, this is great. I can see the store busy. I can see a lot of people are coming and buying stuff. I'm going to buy shares in Radio Shack. So I took my life savings at the time, $5,000, and bought 200 shares of Radio Shack. And within a year, do you know, those shares went all the way from $24 down to $12. So I said, okay, um, if it was a good deal at 24, it must be a great deal at 12. So of course I bought more. And in the next six to eight months, they went down to $6, <laughs> at which time I sold. So my first investment lost me, you know, 75% of my money, which, which kind of sucked, quite honestly. Can I use that word? I don't know. Anyhow, so um, then I said, okay, I think investing works, just not for me. I'm never going to invest again, never going to buy a stock again. This is simply too risky. Um, and so I started investing in mutual funds. And uh, at the time, there was a big fund that had been around for years and years called the 
called the Templeton Growth Fund. This, you know, that, that was a long time ago. Um, and uh, anyhow, they had this chart where they said, had you invested in this fund, you know, going back, I think it was 1956 or something, it would now be worth, you know, something like $2 million in the day. So I said, this is really good. I'm just going to buy this mutual fund. So I did that for a couple of years. And then one weekend I was reading the newspaper back in the day when people read newspapers, when not everything was online. And uh, they mentioned a fellow by the name of Warren Buffett and how had you invested, you know, $10,000, I think 1956 or something, it would now be worth back then, like something like 50 million. And so, so I started basically reading about him and I read a couple of other investment books and I started investing in stocks again. And um, it was a little bit more successful than my first venture into the stock market, shall we say. And you're, you were quite a saver. So how much of your earnings would you actually estimate that you saved on average? Percentages, gee, I don't know. It, it would depend on, on, on the time and, and you know, um, there was a balance in there. Like I don't have any really bad habits. I don't smoke. I have like five beers a year. Like I almost don't drink, you know, um, I, I don't even drink coffee. So I'm not, you know, going out every day, spending two, three bucks or five bucks, whatever, you know, f f for a coffee. So don't have big spending habits, um, but don't deny myself because, you know, after I graduated from university, I took a summer off, backpacked around Europe. I spent a year backpacking around Australia, New Zealand. I moved to Vancouver for a year. Then I moved to Asia for a few years. So I was having some fun, but I wasn't spending on frivolous things, if that makes sense. And the biggest thing I don't spend is frivolous landfill crap. Like, you know, the stuff that you get at dollar stores that you use once and throw it out, tend to avoid that most of the time. And you mentioned talking about like going traveling after school and stuff, but that wasn't something where you kind of borrowed money or anything like that. You had put money aside for that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I had, in fact, I talked about this in my first book. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't borrow money to, to travel, but I had made a rule of, with myself that I had to save at minimum. And this is going back in the day, back to the early 1990s. I had to save at minimum $200 a month, which was the baseline. Sometimes, some many months I'd save more, but that was the baseline. And so I went tra when I went traveling and stuff for a year in Australia, I wasn't saving that amount. So in my mind, that was a debt I owed to myself. So when I get, got back to Canada, um, there was a while where I was working crummy jobs. I was a telemarketer for a while. Isn't that terrible? Um, but anyway, I was doing that. And then I got this temporary job at Revenue Canada processing tax forms, both jobs I didn't really like, but I worked both jobs. I worked like 70 hours a week or whatever the amount was you know, for a period of six to eight weeks and I saved it and I paid back myself. I paid back myself the 2,400 that I had owed, quote, quote, owed myself from the time I had been away and I hadn't been consistently saving. And again, that was a baseline. When GST came out, they started issuing GST credits, that went into savings. When I got a tax return, that went into savings and on and on it went type thing. So you've continued to save over the years, even kind of post-retirement, build your nest egg, but saving alone isn't really enough to retire early. So what were some of the savvy investments that you made in those early years that really kind of accelerated your portfolio returns? The aha moment for me was reading a book by Peter Lynch, which was written, I believe, in 1989. So we're going back in time, but it's still totally applicable today. Now, Peter Lynch, for anybody that doesn't know, was the manager of a huge fund, huge mutual fund in the United States, the Magellan Fidelity Magellan Fund. And I read his book and he talked about how he invested. And, you know, 90 percent of the book was not applicable for me because he a big portion of the book was talking about finding the next big thing. Um, the problem is, is that I'm not that smart. So I can't find the next hot thing. But a couple little lines in the book just changed my whole perspective. And he said something to the effect of you could do a lot worse than simply buying the stocks in the Moody's Handbook of High Dividend Achievers. Now, I'm going way back in time. I was reading this in the early 90s. And I went to the, the main branch, the Ottawa Public Library, and deep in the, in the corridors there, I found a book, an old dusty book in the creek when I opened it up, and it gave a list of the Moody's Handbook of High Dividend Achievers. So it was a list of companies that had managed to increase their dividend 10 consecutive years or more. And to me, that was the aha moment. That was the light bulb going off because most investors, when they're buying stocks, you know, the, the example I gave in my first book the analogy I give is kind of like planting a tree. So you have your seeds, that's your saving. You plant it, you grow a tree. Most investors envision, okay, I'm quickly going to chop the tree down, sell it off for firewood, make a lot of money and get out. That's great, but that's kind of like the casino approach. My approach was, yes, plant the seeds, grow a tree, but wait for the fruit to grow. Once the fruit goes, you come and harvest the fruit. The tree is still standing. The next year you harvest the fruit again and again and again. And that was the basic core, um, dividend investing. So I keep the stocks. I tend not to buy and sell, buy and sell. And I just harvest the fruit. I collect the dividends year after year after year after year. And along that journey, 
Um, if you want self-reinforcement or whatever, what you can do, I talked about this in my fifth book, I think, but what you can do is you can focus on certain bills. So for example, let's make up a random example. Supposing you have a cell phone, you know, and you pay, I don't know, $50 a month for your cell phone. Well, think of who your cell phone provider is. There's a few of them in Canada and invest in that stock. And the stock dividends are like six, 7% right now. And so, you know, you can pay $50 a month from here to the end of time, or you can pay a lump sum, right? Of whatever amount that is, eight or $10,000. I'm not doing the math in my head quick, but you know, then you'll never have to pay a cell phone bill again. That bill is gone from your life for the rest of your life. Then do the same with your gas that you put in your car, do the same with your electricity. And step by deliberate step, you get to the point where suddenly you wake up one day and you say, you know what? If I don't want to go to work, I don't have to because my stocks are paying my bills for me. That's basically it. So speaking of dividends, you're a huge believer in dividend growth investing, which was your style for many years leading up to and in the early part of your early retirement. Can you explain how it works and why you like it so much? It works because it's simple enough for a six-year-old to illustrate with a crayon. Okay. It's simple enough because these are generally the stable, steady dividend payers are boring. If you talk about them at a cocktail party, no one will say, hang around you and want to talk about it because they want to talk about the next dot com or high tech or whatever. Like again, years and years ago, I bought Colgate and I read the annual report and a couple lines jumped out at me. One of the lines was Colgate has paid uninterrupted dividends. That's interrupted in dividends without stopping. I forget the year since something like 1896. Okay. And then the next line was Colgate has increased its dividends. I don't remember the exact amount, but something like 50 consecutive years. That's all I need to know, because if you think about it, okay, so, so, you know, do they pay the dividends? Yeah. Through the great depression, through the first world war, through the second world war, whatever they were paying dividends. And then you also know that they've increased their dividends for 50 consecutive years. So if you buy it when there's a short-term problem, when the prices come down, you would hope that it continues. Again, there's no guarantees, but you hope that it continues. And every, once you bought it, you know, the amount of fruit you're harvesting, so to speak, the amount of dividends you're collecting is just constantly going up. And all you have to do is hold onto the stock and cash the checks when they come. That's it. And you don't have to do anything. Like once you buy the stock, you just, the money gets sent to you and that's all you have to do. You, there's, there's, you don't have to lift a finger. It's, you're just sitting on your assets basically, right? So what are some of the criteria that you look for in a dividend growth stock that suggests to you it's a good fit for your early retirement portfolio? Very simple thing. So I'm looking for something that's recession proof or recession resistant. So you don't want something that um, does good when the economy is good and, and falls apart when the economy you know, doesn't do as well. Right. So like car companies would not fit that bill because, you know, if you feel confident in your job and everything's going hunky dory, you know, you might go out and buy a new car. But if suddenly you're worried about getting laid off or whatever, you're going to keep the old clunker a few years longer because you don't have the money to spend. So you want something recession proof. An example would be like the hydro that we use. I mean, we, we need hydro right every month. Um, the gas that heats your home, uh, you need it. I mean, we live in Canada. It's going to get cold in the winter and you're going to need it. Um, you know, toothpaste, wonderful investment, toothpaste. You know, I mean, we all hope that we all brush our teeth every day, hopefully multiple times. <laughs> And you know what? When I was a kid, Colgate and Crest were the main brands. They're the main brands today. They're the main brands when my, when my dad was a kid. They were the main brands when my grandfather was a kid, as far as I know. A money-saving tip is not going to be to go home and say, okay, we're going to stop brushing our teeth for a while until I know if my job is stable. You're going to keep brushing your teeth. So simple, simple, simple. Simple enough for an illustrate, a six-year-old to illustrate with a crayon. That's what you want to focus on. Um, as far as the buy side goes, I'm generally looking for some kind of short-term fixable pessimism that's driving down the stock, you know? So I think when I got Colgate like a hundred years ago or whatever, I don't even own it anymore, but yeah, they, they had a bad quarterly returns or something and the stock price went down. It was time to buy. So you're looking for fixable, fixable is the key short-term issues. So it's, sometimes it could be a macro situation too. So for example, right now in the markets, um, you know, I would argue that the high dividend payers have become cheaper because in interest rates have gone up. So as, as interest rates go up, Many investors say, okay, I'm not going to buy stocks anymore. I'm going to sell my stocks and move it over to fixed income or whatever. And that's caused the price of dividend payers to, to, to come down to some extent. So right now is actually a very reasonable time to go looking for opportunities because there are some out there. There's, there's one other thing I'll add too, is as Canadians, sometimes opportunities, like I did really, really well when I bought U.S. stocks back in 2010, 2011. Because if you recall, at that time, our dollar was trading roughly at par. And so you can do some cross-border shopping at times too. It's more applicable for Canadians, but when you see the dollar going up, 
might encourage you to look abroad. Okay, Derek, would you say you generally aim to hold dividend growth stocks you buy for the long term and simply add to your positions over time? Or do you try and time the market and sell them at what you feel are opportune times? Ah, that's a really good point. Um, when I'm first buying the stock, my goal is to hold them forever. Okay, I think in my first book, the analogy I gave is, look, we're not dating here. Okay, this is a marriage till death do you part kind of thing. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Going in, we're not thinking, oh, great. You know, I'm going to sell this for $40. You know, I'm going to buy this for $40 in a month from now. I'll sell it for 50 and make a quick gain. Woo no, we're trying to buy it. Now, having said that, if the stock price runs up irrationally for whatever reason, I'm not adverse to taking a profit. I'm not adverse to selling it and redeploying the funds into something better. That's not my goal but it can happen from time to time. So it could be it could be to the specific company or it could be to the general market. It just it just depends. We've heard some dividend investors say they don't really care much about portfolio diversification because they're only concerned about basically the stability and growth of the dividend income that they receive. What's your take on that? I'm not going to buy all five or all six big Canadian banks and say, OK, I'm done. Like we're all good because they're all going to move in tandem to a point. Yeah, I, I, I want various um, various companies. And I, I would even go so far as to say I wouldn't only focus on the generous dividend payers. Like, like I'm not going to lump in utilities and telcos and pipelines all in one. And, you know, that'll be my portfolio because I want a little bit more diversification than that. So, um, no, I'm not in that camp. I, I want a little bit more diversification in case. I don't just want everything to go bad all at once. I like a little bit of diversification. Is there any sort of limit that you have kind of to each position within your portfolio to kind of make sure you have diversification? Yeah, I try not to go over 5% in any one position. Um, I'm not going to name names, but I have one exception in my portfolio. I think it's up around 12, 13%. It's incredibly diversified conglomerate. So I, I'm fine with that. But generally speaking, um, not about 5% in any one position. Most of my positions are about 2 to 3% of my portfolio or so. Yeah, something to that effect. Um, and just a quick note to our viewers, you can hear more about the ways to pursue dividend investing from a panel of DIY investors with very different approaches. It's called Three Ways to Build Wealth with Dividend Investing, and it's available in the Learning Center on WebBroker and on TD's YouTube channel. Um, one of your key investments kind of in this, this process was an investment in a tobacco company that was under pressure at the time. Can you walk us through your thinking with that investment thesis? Yeah, this is in the early or the mid 1990s. Um, again, I don't smoke or anything, but I do believe people have the right to if they want to. Anyhow, um, at that time, the U.S. states and the United States were suing the tobacco companies. They were suing the tobacco companies. Actually, R.J. Reynolds was the leader and Philip Morris was the secondary company. They implemented the, the, the campaign, the Marlboro Man or something, and through the 60s and 70s and 80s, their market share kept gaining. And by the 80s, they had actually surpassed R.J. Reynolds. So they were being sued for past um, hurt that they had caused people. Really, really cheap stock. It got totally beaten down and whatnot. And I researched the heck out of it. And um, somewhere I came, I don't remember, I'm going from memory here, but something like for every five cents, they could increase the price of a pack of cigarettes. They would generate a billion dollars in revenue. And so I began to think, you know, and sorry, I hate to say it this way, but do governments really care about people's health or do they care more about money? And I think at the end of the day, they care more about money. So they didn't want to bankrupt the tobacco industry. They wanted to, you know, get their pound of flesh, basically. So, you know, and that's ultimately what happened. They, they, they raised taxes to a certain point. You know, the, the, the tobacco companies signed on. They, they pay a certain amount every year for, for settlements or whatever, and life continued as, as, as previously, and the companies continue to make a lot of money. And in fact, they've almost become solidified because um, the marketing was banned. So no new entrants can come into the market because you can't advertise any new products. You can't do displays. There's so many restrictions now that the entrenched uh, mature companies are entrenched. And so they keep making money hand over fist. And so I, I invested in that. And... I guess in a period of six months or whatever, I doubled my portfolio and that was good, I guess. Doubled your portfolio with that one. Wow. That's, that's, that's a unique circumstance. You said you couldn't pick like the, the next big company to go from $2 to whatever, but that was a huge, that was a pretty big uh, impact, I suppose. Yeah. And to reiterate too, though, that was somewhat fortunate and it's not something that I would generally do. Like I bought one stock and I, I mean, I was 25 and I thought I was really smart. I think I'm less smart now, so I, I wouldn't be so aggressive, but it worked out.
And did you borrow on margin to to complete that? Was there borrowing involved with that? Yeah, I, I, I was pretty confident that I was right. I did borrow on margin. But at that time, because uh, Philip Morris shares had been driven down so much, they were so cheap. I forget what the dividend yield was, 7%, 8%, and I was borrowing at 5 or 6%. So I was actually getting paid to borrow money. It was, it's, 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 it's the opposite of some cases where you're paying to borrow money, you know, because, and yeah, anyways, so, so, so that's another factor to add into the, to the mix. I never borrow on margin now. And now, had that bet never happened or had margin never be, been used, I think with my strategy, I still would have been retired early, but maybe not as early as 34. The strategy is still applicable. Um, but this is one of these, don't try this at home, folks. So I wouldn't put all my money in one stock. I wouldn't borrow heavily on margin. You know, those are things I would never do now. Um, but but the basic premise of dividend paying stocks has worked well and will continue to work well, in my opinion. So in general, your kind of perspective for other people looking to do, you know, to be retired early is not necessarily a used margin to maybe go with the lower risk route, kind of more steady as opposed to going for something like that. 100%. <laughs> Again, when I was 25, I thought, hey, I'm the smartest guy in the world. Um, I don't I don't have that confidence anymore. So no, absolutely not. You want to you don't want to bet the farm sort of thing. You don't want to bet everything on, on one thing. So, you, you know, you, you tend to spread it around a bit more, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Um, and in your opinion, is it necessary for investors to try and beat the market to retire early or could early retirement actually be achieved with more passive investing like index investing, for example? I think we've created these benchmarks, which are really meaningless. Like what's your goal? Is your goal of bragging rights? Is your goal to say, Hey, I managed 16% compounded annual returns over the last 10 years. Or is your goal to be able to say to your boss, you know what? I don't work here anymore. Like, you're nice. It's been fun. See you later. I don't need to. What's your goal? What is your goal? Because if that's your goal, then your performance in the market is totally irrelevant. What it is, is you, you totally flip the whole thing on the head. Like, what I mean is most people are saying, oh, you need $2 million, $3 million, whatever, which seems insurmountable. That's like climbing Mount Everest. So people just give up. But you don't. You need a certain amount of income every year, right? So you figure out what income you need. Now, the income you need is not what your income is now. Like what I mean is if you work and make $100,000 a year now, you don't say, okay, I need $100,000 of investment income to retire because you know what? If you work and make $100,000 a year and I'm investing and I'm only making $50,000 a year, guess what? I'm paying zero tax because that's the way the dividend tax credit works. You're probably paying about 35,000 in tax. You're paying CPP and EI, I'm paying nothing and nothing. You're, dry, you're commuting to work, you're paying for parking, you're paying for suits, I'm paying nothing, nothing, nothing. At the end of the day, the investor earning 50 grand has more money to spend on Timbits and jelly beans than the guy working and earning 100. Now, we could quibble about whether that's fair or good or whatever, that's a fact. That's the way it is. And so all you have to do is say, okay, if I'm making 100, I have to construct a portfolio that will give me, let's say 50. I'm just using random numbers here. Let's say 50. Okay, so how much do I need to generate 50,000 a year? Well, I don't know. It depends on the yields that you're getting. But right now in the market, there's a lot of stocks that are yielding 6%. So probably eight or $900,000 would be enough to reach that goal. Isn't that crazy? That's not a big number, is it? Right? And as you're going along, and you can see yourself working towards a goal, kind of like climbing a mountain, but you're not climbing Mount Everest now. You're climbing a much smaller mountain. That's how I would look at it, if that makes sense. And so the key thing you're talking about is that kind of dividend yield or actually getting that. But how do you get the core assets, like the dollars that you need to buy those securities to get those yields? Like what is your kind of perspective on the best way to get that, to build that nest egg? Because, you know, you talk about ways to save money and stuff like that. But, but you know, what is the way that we can, the easiest way to get to that? Spend less than you earn. Spend less than you earn. I mean, when I look around, I'm, I'm, I'm astounded at some of the things people spend money on. So I'm not making a judgment. I'm just saying what I see. So when I go to the grocery store, I, I see people buying reams and reams of bottled water, let's say. If you're really clever here in Canada, you can find a way to get water for virtually free. So why buy these bottled waters? It doesn't make any sense to me. Why not get a water bottle and fill it up at the drinking fountain or whatever? Like that, that's a small, stupid little example. But that would be an example. Again, I'm not saying, ooh, give up everything that you enjoy. If you really enjoy it, go for it. But it's making choices. Life is about making choices. If I decide to study A, I cannot study B. If I decide to study B, I cannot study A. If I decide to go to the dollar store and buy a bunch of landfill stuff that's going to be thrown out in three months, that's fine. But I'm not going to have X amount of dollars to save. And, and, and that's what it is. I, I don't mean to distill it down. I mean, do you really need to have a BMW? Can you not have a 
Camry? I don't know. Like I'm just throwing out ideas here. So it's examining your lifestyle. And I, and that's as individualistic as a fingerprint because everybody has certain things that are non-negotiable. And that's fair because life's not worth living if you have no pleasures or whatever. I don't think I have no pleasures. But I think some of the things that we mindlessly, frivolously spend money on, you can sort of give your head a shake and maybe save a few bucks here and there and gradually build it up. And, and the other thing too, is it's self-reinforcing because as a snowball gets bigger, as the snowball is rolling down the hill and getting bigger and bigger, you tend to be more inspired to save more because you're like, oh, I can see I'm getting closer to that goal, if that makes sense. Um, some investors are concerned about high inflation that we've seen recently, which can eat into retirees' income. How much of a concern is that for you as someone still so early in your retirement with a very large family to support? Yeah, that, that's an issue, actually. That's that's a very good one. In fact, I think that's one of the dominant questions right now for investors, because for the for my entire investing career, and quite honestly, most active investors entire investing career, we've lived in a world with gradually decreasing inflation and gradually decreasing interest rates since the early 1980s. There's simply not that many people that have experience in this kind of market where we're either flat or we're heading back up. I, I don't know. I don't think we're going to go back up to where we were in the 80s, but that's all economics. Who knows? But but yeah, so, so it's a different market. Um, so yes, I am worried about inflation. And so I do want some companies that I feel will do well in an inflationary environment. I mean, you can look at some natural resource companies and whatnot. The thing is, is they tend to be very capital intensive businesses and it's boom bust. Um, so in that space, I personally prefer royalty companies. And so they basically um, give some money to the to the resource companies. And in return, they get a certain a very small amount of their production for the life of the of the of the mine or, or, or whatever. And so um, they, they pay out a little bit of money and they keep receiving money. And if we have inflation where the costs go up and the underlying commodity goes up, they just get that top line revenue number. So, so they're kind of protected from inflation, if that makes sense. Um, uh, other companies that you buy once, like real estate, you, you know, you can get look at real estate investment trusts or whatever. You buy them once, and as rents are increased, you don't have to do too, too much to the buildings. Um, that, that will also protect you from inflation. So there are some ways to, to protect yourself, and that is definitely in, in, in my mind. Finding ways to lower the taxes owed on investment income is a key piece of any retirement plan. So what do you do to help keep your tax bill in check? Yeah, I know it's all pretty basic. I'll reiterate the steps because I think they are important. First thing is to maximize your tax-free savings account every year. Um, if you're married, maximize your spouse's tax-free savings account. So th those are, you know, once money's locked in there, that's all tax-free. Tax-free savings account, I think it came out in 2009. I, I could be wrong on that, but around that time. Yeah. What a gift. If that would have been around when I was taking my journey to retire, I, that would have helped me. Not going into debt, not making a few lucky calls would have hurt me, but that would have been a huge help. Maximize that on January 1st or 2nd or 3rd, whatever the first day the bank's open, I'm there, I'm maximizing my TFSA. Why wouldn't I? It's a no-brainer not to because you're putting money in, it's growing and compounding tax-free and it sits inside of that little account and just grows and grows and grows. So it's it's a gift that, that everybody should take full advantage of. Um, second thing is to look for Canadian source dividend paying stocks because the tax rates are very, very favorable. Um, if you get to the point where your portfolio is getting bigger, then you're looking for growthier stocks with lower dividends and higher growth rates. So um, over time, as my dividend income was increasing, I, I was sending more and more money to the CRA, which is great and all. I don't mind doing that. Um, but if I can avoid it, I like it better. And so, um, yeah, so, so, so hypothetically, let's say you're looking at 10%. I'm just making this up. Let's say you're looking at 10% total returns over time, let's just say. And you have two different stocks. You have one that pays an 8% dividend that grows at 2% a year or one that pays a 2% dividend that grows at 8% a year. Well, now I'm more interested in the one growing at 8%, only paying 2% because um, as it grows, um, I, I don't have to pay any tax on that until I eventually sell many, many years in the future. So I'm basically using uh, free money that you know I will eventually owe the government, but I don't owe it today, if that makes sense. All right. And of course, we always recommend individuals chat with a tax professional to talk about their specific situation, but at least interesting to have kind of some concepts uh, to keep in mind some conversation points. All right. We're going to have to leave it there, Derek. Thank you so much for sharing your journey to early retirement and some of the lessons that you've learned along the way. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers? So I wrote the books at a grade three level, and I think that's why they, they were rather popular because it's not complex financial jargon or whatever. It's, it's, it's very, very simple, you know, very, very straightforward, um, simple enough that you could present it to a grade three class and they could read it. 
this approach is not that complicated. I'm not talking, I'm not that smart. I'm not talking about the next, you know, company that goes to the moon or whatever. It's very, very simple, straightforward, you know, one pant leg after the other type of stocks. Um, and if any of your viewers have any questions or you want to take a look at my books, you can go to stopworking.ca. Um, I do try to answer all emails within a couple of days. Like I'm retired, I'm a bit lazy, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions or whatever, feel free. And my books are on there too. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's, it's all, you know, people for whatever reason are attracted to complex strategies and often the simplest strategies work best. Very well said. Very well said. Don't overcomplicate it. Thanks again for joining us. And for those in our audience, make sure to register for our upcoming live webinars and check out our library of on-demand content available in the Learning Center and on our YouTube page. See y'all next time.